All right, let's talk about phototransduction, which is how it is that we transduce light into nerve signals. To understand that, we're going to have to start by understanding a little bit about the structure of the eye. So I'm going to sketch up a human eye here. We'll start out here with the cornea. I'm going to include the general globe of the eyeball. So this cornea out here is this curved transparent surface that actually does most of the focusing of the light. Uh, just inside the cornea, we have this pigmented layer. This is what you, a lot of what you see when you look into a person's eye. So this is made up of radial and circular smooth muscle. This is the colored iris. There. And that opening in the center of the iris, the black spot you see in the eye, is the pupil. So when you look at a person's eye and you see that dark spot in the center of the iris, what you're looking at is actually an opening. That's a hole into the back of the eye. It looks dark because there's no light in there. But that's the opening through which a eye doctor will look through to see what's going on inside your eye. Now, just inside there, we have this usually transparent curved surface. This is the lens of the eye. And it is held in place by some ligaments attached to some smooth muscle here on the sides. And there are suspensory ligaments attaching that lens to that smooth muscle. Now, part of the job of the structure of the eye is to focus light coming from out here, so light coming in this way, gets focused into an image projected onto the back of the eye like a movie screen. Most of that focus actually comes from the cornea. So this does most of the focus. But it's not very adjustable. So to adjust the focus of the eye, we have to use this lens. Now, the lens can actually change shape. Its natural shape is kind of rounded, like so. But when, and we get that when this muscle contracts. So if we look at the lens from a different, if we look at it like straight on as if we were looking into the eye, here's the lens suspended by these suspensory ligaments out to the smooth muscle around it. So here's, the, here's this ring, these rings of smooth muscle around the outside. Now, if this muscle contracts, then it's going to get smaller. So when this contracts, the muscle shrinks, which releases the tension on these ligaments. As that gets smaller, it lets go of the tension there, which allows the, allows the lens to go into a more fat shape. Whereas, oops, I want that to be, if I can, let's get that to be eraser. Whereas when the muscle is relaxed, then our lens is being pulled outward into a uh, flatter shape. This exaggerates it a bit. But when the muscle is relaxed, it stretches the lens out using those suspensory ligaments. Whereas when the muscle contracts, it allows the lens to spring into a fatter shape because the muscle is closer to it. Oops, that should be red. Versus out here where the muscle is way out here. Anyway, so that's how we adjust the focus of the lens. That allows us to adjust our focus between things that are close up and things that are further away. Now, the purpose of all of that is to focus that light onto a layer of cells here along the back of the eye. So we'll do that here in green. That layer of cells along the back of the eye 
is the retina. So, and it's in here, in this retina, that we actually do the transducing and actually some processing of the signal from the light. So we're going to need to focus a little, we're, ha ha, we're going to need to spend a little time talking about what's going on in the retina. But before we do that, I did want to point out a few other things. The cells from the retina, some of the cells in this retina are the neurons which are going to send their axons back toward the brain. So we need to draw all of those axons coming out here. These are all axons from the nerve cells there in the brain. This is the optic. Technically, it should be tracked, although you will also hear optic nerve a lot. And we can have also some, the cells in here need to have um, blood supply, so we can also have some blood vessels coming in and supplying blood to this area. So some blood vessels also coming in. They come in at the same spot. Now, the funny thing about this retina is that the cells are on in an arrangement which is probably not the one that you would normally expect. So let me switch to a new diagram. So let's take another quick look at the back of the eye here. We'll draw one of them up here. So we'll say that's a little bit of the back of the retina. Now, there, we're going to talk about three layers of cells in the retina. And we'll do them in three different colors here. We'll do uh, purple for the first one. The purple are going to be the photoreceptors. And photoreceptors, we'll write that over here. Photoreceptors come in two sorts, rods and cones. Now, the cones are, al are almost entirely found here in the center of, your, of the visual area, in an area called the fovea. So I'm going to draw a dense set of cones right here, which would be the center back of the retina. So this is this area called the fovea. And there are fewer, there are fewer cones as we get further out, and they're less, well, less tightly spaced. So we'll draw a few of those other cones out here. Now, another type, so those are the cones, another type are the rods. Rods are also found, but they're more found kind of loosely spaced out here in the periphery, not as tightly packed as they are there. in the fovea. So we'll sketch in our rods here. And that's the rods. OK, so that's the layer of photoreceptors in the eye. Now, those photoreceptors, while those are the cells that are actually going to transduce the light, and keep in mind the light is coming this direction. These photoreceptors are not the cells that actually send signals to the brain. Instead, these photoreceptors feed onto another kind of cell called bipolar cells. So we'll draw those in. These bipolar cells are receiving from generally several photoreceptors except here where they start to become more dedicated and kind of lean out. I guess I'm making a mistake here by showing rods and cones feeding to the same bipolar cells. That's not really how that works, but that's all right. We'll ignore that for now. So these are the bipolar cells. Those receive inputs from the photoreceptors. And then those are also not the cells whose axons leave the eye. Those, the ones whose axons are actually going to go out of the eye are the ganglion cells. 
and those receive from bipolar cells. Now, these ganglion cells are the ones whose axons are actually going to leave the eye. The problem you'll notice here is that they're here on the inside of the eye. So in order for their axons to get out of the eye, they have to go back through these other layers, which could be a problem if you've got all these axons wandering around between the photoreceptors. So to avoid that particular issue, what we're actually going to do is have a portion on the retina which doesn't have any photoreceptors or other cells at one particular spot. And instead, it's at that spot that the axons for all of these ganglion cells are going to come together and leave the eye. So you can imagine all of these axons from all over the eye all coming together here and coming out all together forming this optic nerve. So there's my optic tract or optic nerve. This is also, as we mentioned in the other one, where the blood vessels are going to be coming into and out of the eye. Now, notice something interesting about that. Right here, where this optic tract leaves the eye, here we have a section where there are no photoreceptors. So there's something odd going on here. That means that my movie screen, where I'm projecting my light onto focusing that image, is going to have a hole in it a spot where you can't actually see anything because there's no photoreceptors here to respond to that light. This is what is known as your blind spot. And part of la the sensory perception lab is about noticing this blind spot in your own eyes. So make sure you make sure you do that lab and refer back to this image when you're doing it. Refer back to this concept. Now, the other odd thing about this is that the photoreceptors are at the back here, which means light coming in has to pass through all of these other cell layers in order to get to the photoreceptors. Um, we don't know if there's any good reason for that. As far as we can tell, there's no particular advantage to be gotten from that. And there are other creatures whose eyes work kind of like ours, for example, cuttlefish, whose retinas, as far as I know, are on the other way around, with the photoreceptors here on the inside on the inside of the eye feeding to other cells, which then leave the eye there at the back. Um, I don't know if this is just an evolutionary accident or if there's some good reason why our retinas are on backwards that we just haven't figured out yet, but it's kind of an interesting point in any case. Now, I'm al also, there are two other kinds of cells here, horizontal and amacrine cells, which kind of go between bipolar and ganglion cells, but we're not really talking about those right now. Now, in order to understand phototransduction, we're going to take a closer look at these rods and cones. And let's talk for a moment about the difference between them. So rod photoreceptors, first of all, they're found mostly in the periphery, so not in the center of vision. And they respond to low light levels. They work quite well with very dim light. In fact, they don't work very well in bright light. Uh, rods can theoretically respond to single photons of light, although I think in practice you usually need a little bit more of that to get them to do much. But the other issue with rods is that they don't have, they all respond the same way to colors. If you were to, uh, they all respond best to sort of a greenish blue.
and less well to other colors. So imagine for a moment that you only have rods, that you don't have any cones. In that case, if you, if you were to look at uh, light of a particular frequency, which is what we call color, let's say you were to look at a spot of red light, and then next to it you saw a spot of green light. If you had rods, you would be able to, you might see one of those as brighter than the other or darker, but you wouldn't have any way of telling which one was red or green because you'd have no way of distinguishing between those two colors. All of your rods respond to both of those and they all respond the same way. They'll all say the red is of this brightness and the green is of that brightness, but you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between red and green because, or really any other color. We could put in a blue dot and a orange dot and all of this, and all of those would look like dots of different brightness maybe, but you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between colors. Now compare that to cones. Cones are found mostly in the fovea. Remember, the fovea is that central part of the retina right here, which is the part that gets the center of the visual image. When you're looking right at something, that image is falling on the fovea. The fovea is densely packed cones, which means it's the part of your vision that has the highest resolution. It actually is pretty small. It only covers about two or three degrees of your visual field. So maybe a couple of finger widths at the very center. But that's the only part where you can actually see really clearly because that's the only part where you have densely packed photoreceptors. And these cones need more light to respond. They don't respond to low light levels. The light has to be brighter. Now, if you've ever done any stargazing, you may already be familiar with that. You may know that if there's a very dim star, that if you look straight at it, you can't actually see it. That's because if I look straight at a dim star, that image is falling on my fovea, which is only cones, and a very dim star doesn't have enough light to activate those cones. So when I look straight at it, none of my photoreceptors respond to that, and so my brain can't see it. If I look off to the side a little, then that image is going to be falling on somewhere here in the periphery where there are rods, and then they'll respond, although I won't be able to see it very clearly because the rods aren't packed closely, I'll be able to tell that it's there. But the other thing about cones is that we have, most people have three different kinds of cones. Red cones respond best to reddish, ye reddish and yellow light. Green cones respond best to green light, and blue cones respond best to bluish to purple light. So that means if, I, if I'm looking right at this red dot here, that red dot is falling on my fovea. And the cones in there that are red cones are sending better signal to my brain than the green and blue cones. My brain has learned that when it's getting signals from this particular kind of cell, it interprets that as a particular color. So when I look at that red dot, I see red because it's mostly my red cones that are responding to it. If I look at this dot, then instead of the red cones responding best, the green cones are responding. So my brain says, ah, that's green. Now this also still brings up some interesting philosophical questions, of course. What is the color red to you? Well, it's the it's what happens in your brain when red cones are sending signals to your to your brain. So how do I know that the experience of red that I experience is the same as the experience that you have when you experience red? And really, there's no way to be sure. I know that we both look at this dot here and we agree that's red. But I don't know what it's like to you to see red. Maybe if I could get inside your head and experience what you're experiencing, that would feel to me like what I call blue. But it doesn't really matter, as long as we both call it the same thing, since there's no way to know what it's actually like to experience it, then 
We just have to agree that we're both looking at the same thing and calling it the same name, which is, again, kind of an interesting thing to consider. In any case, what we're going to be talking about next is exactly how these photoreceptors work. What is it that makes them function? Let's take a moment here to talk about how that blind spot works, because you might not want to believe me if I tell you that there's something in your vision that you can't see. So let me justify it. Let's say we're going to look at a series of letters here. They'll look like this. A, B, C, D, E. So let's take, if I have my eyes focus on the middle of this, this letter C, let's draw my two eyes in here. So here's one of them. There's my cornea and the eye and I'm looking at it like this. So now the image on the back of the eye is reversed so that the A, the image of that A falls over here. So there's A, B, C, D, E. That's what it looks like on my retina. Now here's my other eye. So it's looking the C, so the image of the C is falling here in the fovea. So there's the D, E, oops. A and B. Alrighty. Now, remember when we looked at the structure of the eye, we saw a little bit about where that blind spot was. So if here are my two eyes this time looking straight ahead, both of them rather than both focused on the same thing. We talked about how my retina was here on the back of the eye and how all of the axons from the ganglion cells and all the blood vessels enter and leave the eye together. On each eye, they do that over on the side of the eye closer to the nose. So here's my nose between my eyes. This is where the blind spot is. In my left eye, it's over here on the nasal side, and in my right eye, it's over here on the nasal side. So on my picture here, let's indicate where that is. So my blind spot will be here in this eye and here in this eye. What happens with that optic nerve, those optic nerves then come back, they actually enter into something called the optic chiasm, where we sort of sort out some fibers and then they head back here into the thalamus of the brain. Uh, technically, we can, I guess, draw it in here. If we draw the, oops. If we draw the blue, the right side of each retina in blue, those fibers actually sort themselves out. So they're going this way. And if we draw the left, the left side of each retina in red, those fibers sort themselves out so they go this way. So all the stuff over here on the left side of the retina goes to the left hemisphere of the brain. All the stuff on the right side of the retina goes to the right hemisphere. All right, back to this diagram over here where we're looking at the blind spot. So in the left eye, the letter A is the one falling in the blind spot. So the letter A over here is the one that I wouldn't be able to see. But in this eye, it's the letter E falling in the blind spot. The letter A is visible. It's falling on the retina out here. So if I have both eyes open looking at this C, this eye is blind to the letter A, this eye is blind to the letter E, at least part of my brain is seeing all of the letters, so my brain can figure out, can fill in what's missing from each eye, and I see normally. But now imagine what's happening if I cover this eye. So I'm not, I'm not getting any of this information. If this eye is covered, then the A over here is falling on my blind spot, and this eye can't fix that. This eye doesn't have an A that it's seeing, so it can't fill that in. So if I cover my right eye, then something over here on the left, an image on the left, will be falling on my blind spot, and I may not be able to see that. Likewise, if I were to cover my left eye, it would be this over here that was falling on the blind spot of the only eye that was open, so I wouldn't be able to see the E. The, eye, the upshot of it is, if both eyes are open, 
then you can see then what falls in the blind spot of one eye is not in the blind spot of the other eye. And so you can see everything. Each, each eye makes up for the other one's blind spot. But if you cover one eye, there's nothing to fix what's going on with the blind spot of the eye that's there. So there will be something you can't see, although you won't be conscious of it unless you work hard because your brain will fill in the missing stuff. So that's what we're getting at in that lab. Okay, let's talk about how these photoreceptors work. So cones and rods, in terms of the, the physiology of how they work, are very similar. So we're going to mostly just focus on the idea of a, of a rod photoreceptor here. So a rod photoreceptor looks kind of like this. Where what we've got is the... So light, in this case, comes from this direction. So... This is the front of the eye. This is the back of the eye. Now, in this section, this big fat section here, we're going to have these stacks of membranes that have lots of the proteins we're about to be talking about in them. These proteins in these membrane stacks are what are going to actually respond to the light. Down here, we've got what amounts to an axon terminal. You probably wouldn't technically call it an axon terminal because this is not an axon. This cell it actually doesn't have an axon, but this thing works very much like an axon terminal in that when it's depolarized, it releases a neurotransmitter. So it's got these vesicles, and when it's depolarized, it releases glutamate. Glutamate is just a neurotransmitter. So when this is depolarized, like an axon terminal, it releases glutamate as a neurotransmitter. So our question is going to be, when is it depolarized? The next thing in the line here would be bipolar cells. Which would respond to that glutamate. So we want to understand what determines whether this terminal is depolarized. And that's going to be based on what happens up here in these membrane stacks. So let's get a closer look there. Now, I'm just going to draw in like one example of each of these proteins. You should know that there are thousands and thousands of each of these proteins inside this cell. But let's just draw it simply here. We'll draw... this. All right, now here, here's the proteins we're talking about. This central one, this thing, this is a protein called opsin. And over here, I should have drawn these in a different color. We'll do them in purple. These are phosphodiesterase usually just abbreviated as PDE. So this is a phosphodiesterase, and this one is a phosphodiesterase. There are multiple phosphodiesterases available here. PDE is an enzyme that breaks down a molecule called cyclic GMP. Okay. Now, also in this membrane stack, let's do this one in green. We will have other enzymes. These are going to be guanylyl cyclase enzymes. Guanylyl cyclase will abbreviate as GC. These make cyclic GMP. Specifically, they turn 
something called GTP into cyclic GMP. So, also here, and I'm going to put this associated with the opsin, is a G protein called transducin. So that's there. So this trans, the transducin, the G protein, the phosphodiesterase, and the guanylyl cyclase are all in these membrane stacks. Now, down here, closer to the ax, actually, along here, I'll go ahead and put it in this area. Let's see. Still working on how best to get this thing to do good erasing, but we'll do this. That'll work for now. Here we're going to have some gated ion channels. These are um, cyclic GMP gated sodium channels. Those are down here. But they're gated on the inside. So the spot where the, the cyclic GMP can bind is here on the inside. So these really aren't acting as receptors. They're not responding to anything outside the cell. They're gated by something on the inside of the cell. So let's talk, now let's go over how exactly this works. To do that, I'm going to erase the stuff over here on this side and talk about what's going on in this image. So hold on just a moment. Okay, first let's talk about what's going on in this cell in the dark. So when this is not illuminated by light. Now one thing I have to add in here, we'll do it in orange, is another molecule that we find bound to the opsin. This is something called retinal. Retinal is a pigment. So the, in, in the dark, the retinal is in what's known as its 11 cis form. That means it has uh, one particular bent bond in it, which causes it to fit nicely into this socket on the opsin. So this is bound to the opsin. The transducin is inactive, and the phosphodiesterase, the PDE, has low activity, meaning it is not breaking down cyclic GMP very fast. The guanylyl cyclase is at moderate activity. So what's going on there? is that the guanylyl cyclase is taking GTP and turning it into cyclic GMP. Both of them are. So we'll make, do that here too. GTP is becoming cyclic GMP. And the phosphodiesterases aren't breaking it down very fast. So that there's enough cyclic GMP that it's binding to these ion channels and letting in the sodium. So these channels are open, sodium is flowing in. So this means the channels are open, sodium is entering, and a positive ion coming into the cell will do what to its membrane potential? Sodium entering, positive ion coming in makes the inside more positive, so this causes depolarization. That means that in the dark, if here's my rod, that sodium coming in makes the inside more positive, which depolarizes this and causes it to release glutamate.
in the dark. Now, this is generally counterintuitive for a lot of students because when we think about photoreceptors, we think, okay, we've got a cell here responding to light. That means it should take its active role. It should do its thing, release glutamate when there's light. But photoreceptors are actually the other way around. They release most of their neurotransmitter when it's dark. Light is actually going to make them release less neurotransmitter, which somehow doesn't seem right, and yet it works just fine. And if you think about it, the absence of a signal can be just as important as the presence. If, it for, if you're sitting there in the, your yard, for example, and suddenly all of the bird song goes quiet, that carries information too. So if you think about that that way, that's one aspect of how this actually makes some sense. The other aspect is that is how glutamate affects the bipolar cells. In some cases, the receptor for glutamate makes the bipolar cell more active, but in other cases, it makes it less active. So imagine you had a bipolar cell that was turned off by glutamate. That means in the dark, the photoreceptor is releasing glutamate, which turns off the bipolar cell. But in the light, we're going to release less glutamate, which stops turning off the bipolar cell, allowing it to become active. So in that case, the bipolar cell turns on in the light. In the short version, just keep just know that photoreceptors release their neurotransmitter when they are not illuminated. The light that they respond to makes them release less. All right, so this is the summary of what's going on in the dark. Now let's get into what goes on in the light. See if I can make this work. Okay. So now let's see what goes on in the light. All right. So let's put our retinal back on here to start out. Okay, so the first thing that happens, light is absorbed by retinal. So when the light hits the retinal, it actually changes from being in its 11 cis conformation to turning into, a, to taking a different shape. So our retinal becomes what's known as all trans retinal. It's no longer 11 cis, it's now all trans, which means it doesn't fit on the optin. So it comes off of the opsin. This is called bleaching the opsin. Now remember, there are thousands of opsin proteins in this cell. So, oh, that's interesting, we're getting that, we're gonna ignore that stuff over there. So when the retinal comes off of the opsin, we call that bleaching the opsin, but how many opsins get bleached depends on how much light there is. If it's dim, only a few opsins will get bleached. If it's bright light, maybe many or even all of them will. When the opsin gets bleached, that activates the transducin. So the transducin is activated. And the transducin is going to, in turn, activate phosphodiesterase. So when my phosphodiesterases become active, they're going to start breaking down cyclic GMP. So now PDE is now under high activity. So it, start, it starts breaking down uh, cyclic GMP quickly faster than the guanylyl cyclase can make it. So my guanylyl cyclase was taking GTP and making cyclic GMP. 
But now that cyclic GMP is getting broken down by the phosphodiesterase, which means the cyclic GMP is not available to open those channels. So less cyclic GMP in the cell, which means my channels close. That doesn't necessarily mean all of the channels close. This depends on how much light is absorbed by the retinal, how many phosphodiesterases get active, how much of the cyclic GMP they break down. But the more light, the less cyclic GMP there will be, the more will be broken down by phosphodiesterase, and thus the more the channels will close. Closing those sodium channels leads to less sodium entry, and the cell is less depolarized. When the cell is less depolarized, less positive sodium coming in, or we move farther away from ENA, which means less glutamate release. So the presence of light causes a change in the photoreceptor which then causes a change in its membrane potential, which causes it to change how it's sending signal to the next cell, and that leads to changes in the ganglion cells, which leads to changes in the action potentials being sent to the brain, which results in sight. So it's kind of interesting to think about. Every time you look at something, everything you're seeing is coming from these changes happening in those photoreceptors, which is changing the pattern of action potentials coming back on your ganglion cells, which produces a change in your perception of what you see. So. That's how phototransduction works. Complicated process, but really pretty cool. And there's some other interesting things about this. So for example, you know that if you look at a bright light, then when you close your eyes, you still kind of see that light. The reason that's happening is that if you look at a bright light, lots of this retinal gets, absorbs energy and turns into the transretinal. And actually so much of it happens that the cell become, this cell starts really stops releasing glutamate at all which means that it's signaling that there's bright light. And that retinal doesn't come back instantly. It takes retinal a moment to shed that energy, go back into its cis conformation, and fit back onto the opsin. So if I look at a bright light and it bleaches lots of the opsin in one of my photoreceptors, even when that light goes away, the retinal hasn't all come back right away. And until that retinal comes back, this, as far as the cell is concerned, there's still light. Those transducins are still active, they've still act they've activated the phosphodiesterase, it's still breaking down cyclic GMP, and the cell is still releasing less glutamate. So as far as the brain is concerned, there's still light there. So when you look at a bright light and then close your eyes, there's that after image, which is your, your photoreceptor still telling your brain, hey, I see light there. There's other interesting things that happen with different color photoreceptors being overstimulated. We do that a little bit in lab where we look at color after images. Um, try the lab and you'll see some interesting stuff with that. All right, I think that's about it. So let's go on to the next nervous system lecture.